Okay, Gospel of John, please, in chapter 20. And we're going to read from verse 3 down to verse 23. And the title is very evident from this portion, He is Risen. And so beginning in verse 3, it says this, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord." and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And again, God indeed always blesses the reading from his precious word. And especially this portion, very, very thrilling uh, to see Christ risen. Remember uh, last time we talked about Mary, how she had gone early uh, to the sepulcher and she had noticed that the stone had been rolled away. She didn't look in. She didn't investigate further. Immediately she ran uh, to, to tell Simon Peter and to this other disciple who Jesus loved, we know to be John. And so when they hear this, uh, they themselves run to the tomb uh, to investigate. And, of course, it, it shows something of their courage. For one thing, um, they're running into enemy territory. Uh, could this be some kind of a trap or a snare? Uh, remember, the high priest had asked not only uh, if Jesus was the Messiah, but what was the strength of his following and who were his disciples? And maybe there was a thought that perhaps they could have been ensnared by uh, some kind of scam or scheme uh, to remove the body so the disciples would go and be captured. So they had great courage and uh, they ran 
uh, together. Notice verse four, so they ran together. It's interesting that running is not mentioned very often uh, in the scriptures. Of course, it's uh, mentioned uh, at least in the parable of the prodigal son where the, the father runs to receive the erring son who is restored. But if you look at Matthew 28, there's two portions uh, in resurrection testimony where there's running. In Matthew 28 and verse 8, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verse 8, it says, uh, speaking of the women uh, that the Lord appeared to, and it said, um, and they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And now here, so the, the women were running to tell the disciples the message that he had risen, and here these two disciples running to find uh, or investigate uh, what they'd heard about the stone being rolled away from the tomb. We assume from this verse four that uh, of the two, uh, many believe that uh, John was the younger of the two and perhaps a bit more agile. And so as they run, we find that uh, <coughs> the, uh, the younger one outrun Peter, uh, being John, and came first to the sepulcher. And it tells us uh, that when he arrived there, it tells us he stooped down and looked in. And he saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Of course, uh, we, we see John as very contemplative. And uh, contemplative people uh, don't rush in. <laughs> uh, they ponder. Uh, they tend to be people that, that kind of um, process things more slowly. So he didn't rush in. Uh, he just, uh, it tells us that he stooped down, he looked in, he saw the linen clothes line, yet he didn't go in. And, and so uh, the word looked here, uh, it means a quick glance. And, and what he saw was the linen uh, clothes lying there. Now, let's just remind ourselves of what would this would have looked like. Going back to chapter 19 and verse 38 through 40, we notice uh, it says, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, Thea, being disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at that first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. They took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And so as we put this together, what we see is they would have wrapped linen strips, basically, of cloth around and interspersed it with uh, the spices. And uh, the church fathers have an interesting comment on this. One of the early church fathers said that myrrh particularly, uh, it, uh, it, it glues the linen to the body no less firmer than lead. <laughs> and so the idea is this, that it's, it sets, basically, we would say it sets like concrete, a uh, very, very uh, kind of powerful glue uh, substance, sticky substance that when it's put in uh, and wrapped around the body. And so basically what they would have seen would have looked like, at least John, as he first glanced in, it would have looked like a body lying there. They would have literally seen, uh, you've seen pictures of a mummified body, basically, but they would have seen this cocoon shape. Uh, that's what they would have seen. And uh, he, <clears throat> as he saw that, uh, that was the, all he saw at first glance. But then it says in verse 6, Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So Peter comes on the scene, and in the manner we've come to expect from Peter, he, he's in with both feet. I mean, there's no contemplation, no hesitation with Peter. He bursts right in, just as you would imagine, no standing on ceremony. He barges right in. He sees and again, the word there means he beholds attentively. He, he theorizes. He, he is kind of mulling over what he's seeing. He's looking hard, trying to make it out 
uh, make it all out and, and figure out what it all means. And again, we said he sees this cocoon, uh, spices, setting it like concrete. And then he sees this, uh, the, the napkin about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, several points to make here. First of all, it would indicate to us that most likely the shroud of Turin that there's much hullabaloo about is not exactly authentic <laughs> uh, because uh, as we see here, the headpiece is separated. Uh, and so uh, there's a good possibility that, 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 and again, we don't base our faith on that anyway, but it would at least cause us to be skeptical about that. Secondly, it would disprove clearly the idea of thieves stealing away the body. What thieves would bother removing a body from its grave clothes? And if they did, what would, be, what would it look like? Uh, there's no way they would be able to pull the body out through the neck piece and leave everything else uh, intact. Uh, there would be a shredded and tattered mess left behind. And certainly there wouldn't be a carefully folded headpiece laid at the side. And so, again, what this does show is that, uh, that there's no question that there's no thieves stealing this body whatsoever. Uh, also, it shows the unhurried dignity with which the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. He actually took the time to fold the headpiece and put it neatly by the side. And again, we just see something of his dignity, his majesty in everything that he did, unhurried, unrushed, uh, and uh, leaving behind the evidence which was clear for all to see. It's interesting that when Lazarus uh, was risen from the dead, he came out of the tomb still wearing the grave clothes because he would need them again because Lazarus would die again. <laughs> the Lord Jesus left them behind because he had no need of them. He now lives in the power of an endless life. And what need does he have of grave clothes anymore? And so he left them behind. He lives, he lives, he, I know he lives, and he lives in this power of an endless life. What a wonderful thing. So his body literally would have come through those grave clothes, though that cocoon, if you like, leaving them behind. That's exactly how he would have risen. And we'll we'll make a comment on further comment on that later. Verse 8, then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. And again, he, he makes his entrance, John finally, and it says he saw, and the word there, again, all three different Greek words that are used here uh, means perceived and understood. It's like the lights went on when he saw it. Uh, we use that kind of talk when uh, someone explains something to us and we don't quite get it, and then all of a sudden the lights go on, it makes perfect sense, and we say, I see it now. And so he sees, and it says he believed. Now, it's interesting that his belief at this point is based purely on evidence. It's not based on scripture. Now, because if you notice verse 9, it says, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead, even though the Lord had said it many, many times. And yet, it says, they knew not the scripture. And so, what he believes is that Jesus is risen, and he believes it because the evidence presented before him is absolutely overwhelming. So he knows Jesus is risen. But later on in this chapter, verse 29, it says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And it would indicate that what the kind of belief that is very pleasing to the Lord and a blessing to the person is that which is based entirely on the word of God. Remember Abraham, 
when, when there was no shred of evidence that he would ever be the father of many nations. And yet when God made the promise, it says he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness sake. And so this is the kind of belief that is most thrilling to the Lord. Not that he's not willing to give evidence and there, there's lots of evidence, but he, he, he really delights when somebody has childlike faith and just simply believes the scriptures. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Nevertheless, uh, he did believe uh, because of the, the evidence that the Lord Jesus was risen. It, it is a, a very fascinating uh, thing uh, that they didn't know the scripture, despite the fact that the Lord had over and over again had repeated uh, that he would rise again the third day. And yet they didn't get it. And, and it's so uh, somewhat of an irony when you look at Matthew's gospel for a second in verse uh, chapter 27, Matthew 27, verse 62 to 66. It says, now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together to Pilate saying, sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal, away and, uh, steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. So it is somewhat amazing to me that his enemies remembered that he had said about rising from the dead the third day, but his friends could not seem to remember it, <laughs> which is incredible to think of, uh, even though he had said it many times and made it very clear and explicit to them. Another passage in Matthew that would confirm this to us, Matthew 20 uh, and verse 17. Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples this is Matthew 20, verse 17, apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief priests and to the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock him and, and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. So it wasn't for lack of information. He had told them, and he had told them repeatedly, but they just somehow, it just didn't seem to dawn on them uh, what he had said. So it says they didn't know the scripture, but they would know the scripture. In fact, the Lord would appear to the disciples on the road uh, to Emmaus, and he would give them all the Old Testament scriptural evidence of him rising from the dead. Let's just look back at that marvelous portion in Luke 24 just for a second, and then we'll look at some of the scriptures that proved that he would rise from the dead, that they would quote freely in the Acts of the Apostles as they would um, take this information and put it to good use. So Luke 24 and particularly verse 25, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And so they would have given, uh, been given a, a good introduction, overview, of the Christology of the Old Testament, particularly concerning his sufferings and his rising again. Uh, again, in verse 44 of the same portion, Luke 24, 44, he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And so, of course, some of the scriptures that they would quote freely from uh, in the sermons in the book of Acts, 
would be Psalm 2, verse 7. Uh, and again, we'll just take a moment to look at this, the, the scriptures that would speak of him rising from the dead. Psalm 2, verse 7, it says, I will declare the decree the Lord have said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, Paul and Peter would quote this uh, in Acts 2 and then in Acts 13, verse 33 and 34, in connection with the resurrection from the dead. So that's one of the scriptures. Another one, Psalm 16 and verses 8 through 11. Another key passage that would be quoted. It says in verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. Two other scriptures that we want to pay attention to. Psalm 110, very uh, oft quoted in the uh, early Pentecostal sermons and the ones following uh, concerning the Lord Jesus. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Again, speaking of resurrection and presuming even ascension. Uh, to the right hand of God. And then one more, please, in the prophecy of Isaiah 53, very well known to us, Isaiah 53. And verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Remember, he said he was going to speak to them about the things concerning himself from Moses, from the Psalms, and from the prophets. Well, we've seen the prophets, we've seen the Psalms, and we don't have to look too hard concerning Moses because Paul would apply the Feast of First Fruits uh, directly to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from Leviticus 23. So that's Moses, prophets, Psalms, all of them, the scriptures testify that he must rise from the dead, that he must be that corn of wheat that was planted in the ground and died. But if it died, it would not stay alone, but it would bear much fruit. And of course, Christ, the first fruits of them that slept. I suppose if there's a practical lesson that we can learn from the disciples concerning this, and that, that is simply this, we have to be patient with one another. If the apostles heard from the lips of the Savior time and time again, he was going to Jerusalem, he was going to die, he was going to rise again, and it, the penny just didn't drop. They didn't get it till after he had risen from the dead. Then we need to be patient with one another because sometimes it takes us to hear things many times before the truth of it dawns on us. And sometimes uh, we can be very impatient with our brethren. How can you not see it? Well, the disciples were with the Lord three and a half years, saw lots of things. But one thing they just seemed to not be able to grasp was the fact that he said he was going to die and rise again the third day. So it says in verse 10, then the disciples um, went away onto their own home. And you can imagine that when John went back, remember who he had taken to be with him in his home. He'd taken Mary. And I can imagine that John's new lodger would have been very interested to hear his description of what he found at the sepulcher. <laughs> she would have been, I'm sure, just amazed as she would have heard of this cocoon lying there, the napkin folded, but no body that he indeed had risen from the dead. So we move back now from the disciples back to Mary. We pick up with Mary again. So Mary had obviously come and told the disciples, and then when they had run back, she had made her way back once again 
to the sepulchre. And we're going to see Mary weeping and we're going to see Mary worshipping and we're going to see Mary witnessing in the next few verses. And so we, first of all, it says Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre. Uh, one verse that I think is very interesting in terms of Mary, because she's clearly the first one uh, that is going to actually see the Lord. Uh, and I want us to look back to the book of Proverbs just for a moment and think of this verse in the light of Mary and her devotion and her love for the Lord. Proverbs 8, verse 17, it says, I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. Isn't that a beautiful verse? I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. Well, there's no doubt that Mary loved the Lord and she <laughs> was seeking him early. She went early to the two and she was one that had the privilege of being the first one to see the Lord risen from the dead. So she looked in and it tells us what she saw. It says in <clears throat> verse 12, and seeth two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, how would she know that one was sitting at the head, one was at the feet? Well, obviously you know that by the cocoon shape of the, the actual uh, linen clothes, right? Uh, clearly one end would be the feet, the other end would be where the head would have been, but the napkin was at the side. And so she could clearly see that these two angels were seated at one end where his feet were, one end where his head was. I don't know what comes to your mind as you can consider uh, this scripture, but one of the things that seems to jump out to me is it's almost like a miniature picture of the mercy seat. Do you remember the, the two angels that are the, the cherubim that are over the Ark of the Covenant, one on either side? And then in between is the place where the sprinkled blood was to be placed. And of course, the linen garments too. The high priest, when he would come in that once a year, uh, he'd be wearing special linen garments. So everything about this seems to me to speak to us. Uh, about the mercy seat. Just uh, again, if you want a description of that, it's the book of Exodus. Uh, we'll just take a minute. Exodus 25 and verses 17 through 19. <clears throat> it says, Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubim of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them and the two ends of uh, in the two ends of the mercy seat <clears throat> and it says and make one cherub on the one end the other cherub cherub on the other end even the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on the two ends thereof and so is god giving a message here through what she witnesses is is he not telling us really that the, this is the new mercy seat my son paid the price of sin. He shed his precious blood. He satisfied my every demand against sin. What's so remarkable, I believe, from Mary's perspective is this. How would you respond if you saw two angels in white? Now, would we see a bestseller on the market? The day I saw two angels and talked with them, right? <laughs> I mean, you could just imagine that, right? I mean, I chatted with a couple of angels. I mean, that would be, and again, Mary, she knew a little bit about the spirit world, didn't she? Remember, she'd had seven demons cast out of her. If anybody's knowledgeable in the spirit world, she knows a little bit about it, but she sees two angels and yet it's very evident that Mary is not interested in angels. That's not, not what, where her attention is. Notice it says in verse 13, they say unto her, woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, 
because they have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. See, in Mary's mind, there's only one person in her affections. Angels just don't cut it as far as Mary's concerned. She only wants to see one person. She's come looking and she's looking for her Lord. They've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. She's concerned about the Lord. That's, that's, that's where her heart is. That's where her affections are lying at this, this time. And that's all she can think about. They've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. By the way, isn't it beautiful to hear uh, those words, my Lord? Later on, we're going to hear it from Thomas, my Lord and my God. And isn't it wonderful just to, to acknowledge Jesus, my Lord. We, we should do that frequently. He's my Lord. And, uh, of course, live out the reality of it, that he is my Lord. And so <clears throat> they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not, verse 14, that it was Jesus. Now, one of the things we're going to learn is that Jesus, in his resurrected body, somehow had the ability to withhold his identity. And we, we, we will see that on the road to Emmaus when he's with the two disciples. He's walking with them. He's talking with them. He's ministering to them from the scriptures. And it was only in the breaking of bread that he was made known to them. But for the whole journey, he withheld his identity from them. And now here again, we find him withholding his identity. Uh, it's just not evident to her who this is. So when she had said this, she turned herself back, saw Jesus standing, knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, woman, why weepest thou? And whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Now, again, I don't know how strong a woman Mary was, but in her mind, it's not a difficulty. She feels... If you can tell me where the body is, I'll take it. And, of course, corpses are heavy. They're, they're dead weight. And uh, in her mind, well, again, because love is behind it all. Remember 1 Corinthians 13? Doesn't it tell us love beareth all things? <laughs> and uh, she, she's willing to bear the body of the Lord Jesus. She's willing in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7. It talks about this, that love bears all things. And she's willing to carry the body of the Lord Jesus wherever, uh, but she wants that body back. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of charity, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And certainly her devotion, her love uh, for the Lord, she's willing to do this. And then it says in verse uh, 16, uh, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, and there was something about the way he said that, that she recognized his voice. Because my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And she heard his voice. And it's, so it says, she turned herself and says to him, Rabboni, which is to say, master. So she recognizes who it is. It's the, the teacher, the master the one who's preeminent in her affections, my Lord, uh, my master. And so she is worshiping him at this point. It says, Jesus saith to her, touch me not, uh, for I am not yet ascended to my father. Now, there's a lot of speculation about this verse. Uh, some have, uh, based on typology, have implied that, uh, the Lord is saying, don't touch me because I have yet to ascend to my father and present the blood like the type of the day of atonement. And they see that as a very uh, beautiful picture. Um, however, I, I don't believe, I think that's pushing the type too far. Uh, for one thing, we would say this, that the resurrection has proven that the, the father has already accepted the payment for sin. Right? 
it, it, the resurrection is is God's amen to the the work of the Lord Jesus. So his blood that was shed on Calvary was seen as a clear and full payment for sin. And so the fact that he was raised again for our justification shows that God has already accepted the payment. Uh, Secondly, um, his blood had already been poured out. Uh, He didn't say to them, a body has not flesh and blood as you see me have, but he says a body has not flesh and bones as you see me have. He'd already poured out his precious blood. And so I don't see it as the Lord um, saying to her, don't touch me because I've yet to ascend to my father and present the blood before the, uh, the altar in heaven, the true tabernacle in heaven. I'm sorry if that disappoints you. But what I see here is this. The idea of touch me not is what he's saying is don't cling on to me, Mary, for I'm not yet ascended to my father. In other words, there's going to be plenty of time for you to see me and to talk with me. I'm not ascending for another 40 days. Remember, there were 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. And and so don't cling on to me. Uh, But then he says, but go to my brethren and say to them, in other words, I've I've got a job for you to do. Don't be clinging on to me. Uh, I'll be with you for 40 days. You'll have plenty of time for this. And then, Mary, I have a job for you to do. Uh, something that I want you to do. And of course, the the responsibility that he has given to her, he explains, he says, I'm not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father, to your father, to my God and your God. Now, again, th- this is just a, a, a delightful verse. First of all, he says, go tell my brethren. Isn't that beautiful? The eternal Son of God tells Mary, go tell my brethren. And that brings to our remembrance several verses. Uh, Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, please. Book of Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. Hebrews 2 verse 11. We just want to look at three different scriptures uh, about this, uh, go tell my brethren. It says, For both he, Hebrews 2, verse 11, for both he that sanctifieth and they that who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And then Psalm 22, uh, that great prophetic psalm written a thousand years before the birth of the Lord Jesus, Psalm 22 and verse 22. which says this, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So speaking of Christ in resurrection, uh, he says, uh, I will declare thy name to my brethren. And so go and tell my brethren. And then the final scripture I'd like us to look at is in the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And we're going to look at chapter 3, verse 33 and 34, which anticipates this event. It says, let's just read from verse 31. It says, there came then his brethren and his mother. So this is brethren according to the flesh. And standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, behold thy mother and thy brethren without Seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about on them, which sat about him, and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. So this relationship based on doing the will of God And, of course, this is the will of God uh, that we should believe on him who the Father has sent. And so the one that does the will of God believes on the one the Father has sent. Uh, They're my brethren, he says. These are my real brethren. 
And so what a wonderful thing. Now, I might just say this. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. I would be very reluctant to call him my brother. <laughs> In other words, out of reverence and respect, I personally would prefer to call him my Lord uh, and my God. Uh, however, uh, I, I find it remarkable that he would not be ashamed to call me brother, <laughs> which is remarkable, and it's a wonderful thing. But I, I certainly wouldn't have the liberty of reversing it and saying to him, brother Jesus, I would find that to be very uh, irreverent because of who he is. I think like Mary, my Lord was much more appropriate. And then he says, go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Wonderful to, to think that he, first of all, distinguishes his relationship uh, from theirs. Uh, he's my father and my God in a, in a unique sense that he is the eternal son who ever lived in the bosom of the father. So he, he, he distinguishes it. But at the same time, then he says, he is now your father and your God because we have become sons and daughters through faith in the Lord Jesus. Whoever believes in me, right? They become sons and daughters through faith, but not quite the same. He is the eternal son, but nevertheless, he is, he is our God and he is our father. And isn't it wonderful to, to again, acknowledge my God and my father and, and to just uh, acknowledge that in a wonderful way. So it tells us, in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken these, that he had spoken these things unto her. And so she goes and tells them this news. Now, John doesn't tell us this, but Mark tells us how they responded. And I want us to look at Mark 16 as we try to pull these things together. Mark 16, and we'll see that they had a very different response. When she went and told them what she'd seen in Mark 16 and verse nine, it says, now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. <laughs> so their response, sadly, was an evil heart of unbelief. This is even though John uh, had seen that he had risen, <laughs> uh, but yet they still didn't believe. And there's still some element of unbelief that's clinging to them. And so it says, she told the disciples that he had spoken those things unto her. It says, verse 19, then the same day at evening being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, peace be unto you. Now, again, we want to think a little bit about this first because remember we said that his body was able to pass through the grave clothes and leave them intact. And now we see that his body is able to pass through walls and for him to enter into the room where they were gathered together even though the doors were firmly shut, I'm sure, and bolted and locked for fear of the Jews. And yet Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. Now, that's not to say that his body is not a real body. Uh, it's not some phantom, not some ethereal spirit kind of thing. Because we read that not only did he 
appear to them. Uh, but he also showed them his wounds, which shows a connection with the body that suffered on the cross. Verse 20, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his sides. And so clearly, it is the same body in which he suffered. It still retains the wounds of Calvary. In fact, when we get to glory, I believe that we will still see those wounds of Calvary because it says that we're going to worship the Lamb as it had been slain. And I believe the evidence of him being slain will be presented for us for all eternity. And so, and yet there's a difference. The body is different. It's it's the same in the sense of it has that continuity with the body that died on the cross. The wounds are still there, but yet there are different aspects and properties to that body. Uh, He's still able to eat. Another account tells us that he ate fish with them. And so it, it, it's very similar in many, many ways, but yet different uh, because of its ability to pass through walls. And again, remember that we're going to be made like unto his glorious body. And I believe our body is going to be like that. We're going to have the same, uh, still be recognizable as, as ourselves, uh, still be a continuation from the body that we, we had in our days of humiliation. And yet it will have aspects to it, properties to it, won't have the same restrictions that it has now. Still be able to take food, but will be able to pass through walls and things such as this. So it's it's amazing to even contemplate, think about these things from the text of Scripture. And notice that he stood in the midst. Again, John always loves to keep the Lord Jesus in the midst. And so this, this, in a sense, is a beautiful picture. It's the first day of the week. And the risen, glorified Christ is in the midst of his brethren. And that's a prototype of how every first day of the week ought to be, with the saints gathered to the risen, glorified Lord in our midst. And so the Lord is in the midst. And what does he say? Peace be unto you. And no doubt, his saying this, peace be unto you, there's a certain sense in which their lives had been filled with turmoil. First of all, the events of the crucifixion, then the the news that the tomb was empty and the suggestion that maybe somebody had stolen the body. And so there's all this inner turmoil, what's going on? And then, of course, all the the external threats, uh, their fear of Jews, uh, their doors are bolted, and yet the Lord comes and he preaches peace unto them. Peace be unto you. And, of course, he gives them peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. He gives them peace. By being there, his presence brings peace and comfort in times of difficulty. And so it says in verse 20, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, And then it says, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. What a gladdening sight. Gladdening to see that he was undefeated in death. That even though he had ended at the cross, it wasn't the end. He had risen. And all his claims were now vindicated. He had claimed that he would raise from, be raised from the dead. All these claims were vindicated and it says the disciples were glad. Now I want us to just look in the couple of seconds we have left. John 16, John chapter 16, verses 20 and 22. Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice and you shall be sorrowful but your sorrow shall be turned unto joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, 
and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. <clears throat> and so it tells us, just as the Lord has said, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Oh, how we have reason this morning to be glad, because Jesus is alive. Yes, he died. He died to pay for our sin. He bore our sin in his own body on that tree. And he was buried, as we saw last time. But he rose again. And he's alive. And I hope that we would say, then are the disciples glad. When we saw the Lord through the eyes of faith, remember, blessed are those that have not seen and yet believed. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen. Mm -hmm.